one of the greatest things God has ever given man was His Word. Because inside of His Word, God's Word, we can learn what God would have for you and me. We can learn what God has done to bring us to the point that we're at in the history of the world, in the history of mankind. And we can see what God wants for you and me. We can study the Bible, we can learn from God, and we can walk with the Scriptures every day in our lives to see where we need to be and what we need to be. This morning on Walking with the Word, we're going to talk about the establishment of the Lord's Church. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to the Scriptures. And we're going to look at a passage or two passages of Scripture to help us see the church in its establishment. And then we're going to notice some great things out of Scripture to help us see what can be in our lives and who we can be as we study together. So join me today on Walking with the Word as we open up our Bibles, as we study to see what God has to say about the establishment of the Lord's Church. Within the pages of God's inspired Word, we learn the truth which shows us the way that will lead us to heaven. The Church of Christ at East Hill invites you to study with us for the next 30 minutes a portion of the Word of God. Listen now to these encouraging words in song and then have your Bibles ready for the lesson for today. Good morning and thank you for tuning in to Walking with the Word. I'm Jonathan Burns, the minister here at the East Hill Church of Christ. and We're located at 509 East Madison Street in Pulaski, Tennessee. And we are a group of people who want to be by the book. We want to take the Bible, we want to open it up in our lives, and we want to be what the Bible says we're supposed to be. And thus this morning this program, Walking with the Word, is arranged to help us understand that we can open up God's Word, we can study God's Word, we can make proper application of God's Word, and we can walk with the Word every day in our lives. Today we're going to study the establishment of the church. And we're going to see, as we've noticed over the last few weeks, that the church has been talked about inside of Scripture. And in the New Testament the church was to be established. And what we're going to do is look at two different areas today. We're going to look at some things that have to do with the establishment of the church. We're going to look at Jesus and Peter, and we're going to look at the book of Acts. And then later we're going to look at five different things that have to do with what the church is and our relationship to Jesus inside of the church as we study this morning about the establishment of the church. Now the first two things I want you to notice with me is the promise and the reality. You see, the church was promised to be 
And then there was the reality when the Lord's church was established. Now the promise comes in Matthew 16, 13 through 20, where Peter and Jesus are having this conversation together and Jesus was talking with the disciples. Verse 13 begins, When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, and some Elias, and other Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Jesus is talking to the disciples here and He wants to know what the world thinks about Him. And, and they recognize, well, some say that you are. Some say that you're John. Some say that you're Elias. Some say you're Jeremiah. Or, or you're just one of the prophets, Jesus. But Jesus makes a turn with the disciples and He recognizes what the world thinks about Him. But He asks the disciples this very intriguing question, beginning in verse 16, 15. He that saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he and his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. You see, Jesus recognized something. He recognized this great confession, this great statement that Peter had made, that thou art the Son of God. And it's upon that authority that Jesus Christ builds the church. And thus he builds it up and says, upon this rock I will build my church. Because of this, Jesus says, because I am who I am, because I am who you have said I am, and because I am who the Father has let me and had me to be. He says, I will build my church. You see, no one else can establish the church like Jesus did. And we see this inside of Scripture. And then we see the reality of this taking place. And this brings us to the book of Acts. Now, I know what we're doing quickly is we're going through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're seeing the establishment of the church. And we see inside of the book of Acts... We see the reality of these things, especially in Acts 2.47. It says this, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lord is the only person who can add you to the church. You see, it was Jesus who said, Upon this rock I will build my church. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. You see, Jesus had a plan. The Father had a plan and they were executing this plan. And you see this happening in Acts chapter 2. You see in Acts 2.47 that the Lord added people to the church. But in verse 37 and 38 as Peter is presenting this message, this is what happens in the crowd. Verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? You see, before we see what happens in verse 38, I want you to see that Peter is presenting this sermon and he's telling them, you have crucified Jesus. Men and brethren, what shall we do? They, they, they stopped the lesson. And Peter responds to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You see, it is the reality. They knew what they needed to do. The promise had been made. Jesus made it established. And now Acts 2.47 tells us the Lord is adding people to the church through repentance and baptism. One is added to the church. Acts 2.37 and 38. In Acts 2.47, Lord, the Lord is the one that adds you to the church. We start to see the promise and the reality. The church has been established in the time that we find ourselves in Acts chapter 2. So the establishment of the church is on our minds today as we begin to discuss what took place and what this did establish inside of this. We're going to see five things in the establishment of the church. We're going to see Christ, who gives forgiveness. We're going to see the kingdom, which has subjects. We're going to see the church, which has people who are called. We're going to see the body, which has members. And we're going to see the house, which has and is a family. You see, all of these things are found in the church and through the establishment of the church, through the authority of Jesus Christ, through the planning of the Father, and through the execution of God's plan, the church can be an establishment. And Matthew tells us that Jesus will build His church 
Acts chapter 2 tells us that the church was established and that the Lord adds people to His church after they obey Him. So we can see Christ, the kingdom, the church, the body, the house. And therefore we can see forgiveness. We can see us being subject to Christ inside of this kingdom. We can see that we're called to be a part of the church. Not every church, but of the church. That's very specific. We're called to be a part of the body. We're members of the body and we're a part of the house, which is a family. So today, let's study about what was established with the church. Let's begin by talking about the Christ who gives forgiveness. Two passages to note. The first is Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to have all spiritual blessings that are found in heavenly places... You must be, Ephesians 1, 3, inside of Christ. I love the idea here. The idea is we have a God, we have a Father, we have Jesus Christ who is blessed and He has blessed us with all of these things of which we can be a partaker of. I love the scenes of Ephesians 1, 3, because of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all of these things in heavenly Places. You see, the church puts you in connection with the road, with the lifestyle of which is going to heaven. But not only Ephesians 1 3, also 2 Timothy 2 10. It reads this way Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It's Paul writing here in 2 Timothy. And he's telling them, I'll endure everything I can for the elect's sake, for Christian's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I'm here to tell you one thing today. You will never have salvation. I will never have salvation if I am outside of Christ. And that tells you and me that I've got to be inside of Christ now. Acts 2, 37 and 38 tells me to be responsive to Christ and to be in Christ and for the Lord to add me to the church through Christ. I've got to repent of my sins and I've got to be baptized. And therefore I can be inside of Christ and because of Christ I can have forgiveness. Everybody needs forgiveness. There's not a person in this world who is exempt from the pains and problems of sin and temptation. But not only is there the Christ who gives forgiveness, there is the kingdom which has subjects. And I want you to notice with me 1 Timothy 6, 14-15. Paul writing here again, "...that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in His time shall He show." who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Ladies and gentlemen, if there is going to be a kingdom, there's going to be subjects. If there is a kingdom, there is a king. And we're not the king. You and I are not the kings of the church. You and I are not the rulers of the church. We are the subjects. And I love Paul here. He tells us we've got to keep the commandments of God and we've got to be unrebukable. We've got to be who we're supposed to be till the Lord comes back which will in His time shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. God's going to show who that is, but we've got to show ourselves to be His subjects. I love to study about Jesus in the New Testament. And I love to look through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and see how many times that Jesus mentions that He's going to be about His Father's business. Jesus was obedient to the Father. We can be obedient to Christ because He's coming back. And I want to be subject to Him because there is a kingdom, there are subjects, and there is a king. But not only that, notice with me Colossians 1.13. Jesus Christ who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. It's God's planning, it's Jesus' work. We've been brought into the kingdom. I love the illustration of that. I love the fact that it's a kingdom because we have a king. I love the fact that it's a kingdom because there are subjects. I love the fact that it's a kingdom because, ladies and gentlemen, if there is a kingdom, there's a king. If there's a king, there's a head. And we have Jesus Christ as our head in the Lord's church. I'm so proud that the Lord's church does not have at its headship me or you or someone else because inside of this kingdom there are subjects and there is a king. Now this kingdom is also called the church. And the church is called outside of the world. And thus we see in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 a principle that goes into our lives. 
Talking about Jesus put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Ladies and gentlemen, the church is the body. The body is the church. The church is the kingdom. And you can be a part of that. You can repent and be baptized for admission to the Lord's church, not to be added to a denomination. The Lord's church is not a denomination because denominations come out of the mind of men. You see, the Lord's church comes out of the mind of God. And inside of this, he is, he is head over all things of the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. We're notice the church that's called. And ladies and gentlemen, inside of this, Jesus Christ is the head. And He fills all things. So who is doing the calling? It's Jesus Christ. It's Colossians 1.18 that talks about this. And He is the head of the body, the church. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He might be the only exalted one. You see, the church is not about you and me being in responsibility for the church. Now, now there is a sense, don't, don't, don't mishear me today. There is a sense in which we are responsible for the church. You and I compromise. We make up the church. And ladies and gentlemen... There is responsibility in that. Where great reward is given, much responsibility is, and much time is dedicated to that cause. But inside of this, we learn that the church is called. It's called through Jesus Christ, through the head of the kingdom, through the head of the body, through the head of the church. It's Jesus Christ who calls. But inside of this, there is the body, and in this body there are members. Now notice Ephesians 5.23, a beautiful passage about marriage and the church. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. We're trying to illustrate today the body of Christ, the collective body of Christ that's been purchased by Christ that is the church. I love the illustration of this. The, hus the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior, listen to this, of the body. The body of Christ. That which is all of those who have been added to the church, it is the body of Jesus Christ, Ephesians tells us. But Colossians 3, 15 says this, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. I want to ask you a question this morning out of Colossians 3, verse 15. Why are there so many bodies in our world? Now you and I understand that in the life that we live, we are born and we will die. And we understand that you were born with your body and I was born with my body and that makes us distinct, it makes us different. And isn't that a good thing? Aren't you glad you're not all like me and, and I, aren't I glad we're not all like you? The body makes us different, but inside of the church there is only one body. Why are there so many bodies because they're different. You see, I'm here to tell you this morning that we can all take the Scriptures and we can be a part of the same body, but we're going to have to follow the Scriptures because inside of this there's the body, there are members, and the members are driven by the Word of God. And if we don't, if we don't allow the Word of God to drive our lives, we'll let somebody else's Word drive it. And let me tell you, I'd rather stand with God than fall for anybody. There is a body inside of the establishment of the church. But not only that, there is a house. There is a house of which we can notice. And this has to do with the family of God. It's Hebrews 3, 6. But Christ is a son over his own house. Whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. I believe Paul is writing here in Hebrews 3. And he talks about Christ as a son over his own body. It talks about Christ as being the one over the house. And I love this in Hebrews 3, 6. Whose house are we? And I want you to hold on to something in this. Whose house are we? But he says in this particular passage, if. You see, there are a lot of words that should mean something to us in our lives. And I believe this is one of those words that should mean something to us. If we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end, I'm here to tell you today the only way we can have confidence is to get inside of God's Word. God's Word is the only thing that can tell you the truth. God's Word should be important to us in our lives and we should put it into our lives. 
I'm here to tell you today that there are many different books that people are using. There are many different things people are using to let them understand religion. There are many books. There are books that men have written that mankind is using. There are many different groups who claim to be following after Christ, but yet they'll use different books as their means of organization or as their means of what they are going to do. What if we just used God's Word as the book of what we're going to do? There's also the book of emotionalism. And let me tell you, Sometimes we read that book more than we read any other book and we let our emotions drive us into what we're going to do and how we're going to worship. We use the books of reasoning. Well, God never said we could do it. Sometimes we tell ourselves. We need to understand what God says and how God said it, don't we? I love this illustration. But Christ is the son over His own house, but whose house we are. We are a part of the house that belongs to Christ. We're a part of the church if we're obedient to Scripture, and if we hold fast, if we keep firm, that which God has given for you and me. You see, Hebrews 3, 6 tells me I've got to keep it firm. But not only that, it says I've got to hold it firm. I've got to keep this confidence. I've got to rejoice in this hope firm unto the end. When do I get to lighten up and, and just be relaxed in my faith? Till the end. You see, I appreciate seeing people who work hard all of their lives because they understand a principle that I believe we've let down in our world. We've become a world that says, give me, give me, give me. You work, you give it to me, I'll do what I want to do, you take care of me, I'll take care of no one. I love to see people who have worked all their lives, not because they worked all of their lives, but because it was instilled in them the principle of working unto the end. I love that beauty in that. And I love to see someone who has worked to the end in their spiritual lives. There are people that we know who pass away. And funerals are hard. There's no doubt about that. But it's so much more obtainable. It's so much more endurable when we know there are loved ones who have obtained and they've worked firm unto the end. They've had that confidence. They've had that rejoicing in the hope that's found in Jesus Christ. You see, that's what we need to have, Hebrews 3.6. But listen to 1 Timothy 3.15 as well. Paul writing here says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Paul wanted to come see them. Paul wanted to come see Timothy again. He says, but if I tarry long, but if I can't make it, he says, you'll know how you should behave yourself in the house of God. Inside of the house of God. I love the illustration there. The house of God. Now where I live, now we don't use these terms very often, but, but listen to me for just a minute. Open your mind for just a minute. Open your ears. Where I live, it's the house of Jonathan. Now, I, the only reason I say it that way is because I'm the, the father, I'm the household. I, I'm supposed to be the, the head of the house. But in the church, it's the house of God. I'm so glad that 1 Timothy 3.15 does not say the house of Christians. Because that would indicate to me and it would indicate to you that it was up to the Christians to decide how it's going to be. But he says it's the house of God. It belongs to God. It was the plan of God. This was established because of God. He says inside of this you need to know how you should behave in the house of God. That tells me a couple of things. Number one, I've got to know that I'm supposed to behave right in the house of God. That means what I do, what I say, how I live, how I act, those things matter. Our world tells us all the time, it doesn't matter how you live. Live what makes you happy. But God says, you're going to live in my house. You've got to know how to behave inside of the house of God. Now listen to this, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. The problem is there are a lot of churches today who are outside of the living God, which means they're following a dead one. I want to follow the living God, don't you? 
I want to be a part of the church that's found inside of truth, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Everything we do has to do with truth. And ladies and gentlemen, that's found inside of Scripture. And we can be a people who know that this house, and this is what's beautiful about this, this house is a family. The church is a family. Now, there's something I know about families and you do too. In every family... Now, whether we like this or not, now don't take offense to what I'm getting ready to say. In every family, there are some weirdos. There's some goofy people. In every family, there's some uptight people. In every people, there's some very serious people. Every family, there's some lazy people. But they're a family, aren't they? In every spiritual family, and there's only one spiritual family, there's only one house which belongs to God, there are going to be different people. And I'm so glad that we're different God made sure that it was different because inside of the establishment of the church, He set it up so that we could see Christ who gives forgiveness. In the establishment of the church, He set it up so there could be a kingdom and we could be His subjects. He set it up so it would be a church, one singular. I will build my church, Jesus says. And we're called to that church by the gospel. We can be a part of that body, which means I can be a member of that and oh, being and having a belonging means so much. And being a part of that house means I am a part of a family. I have somewhere to belong. You see, the establishment of the church has given us everything that we've ever needed. And will always throughout its history, as history continues to march on until the world is over, will still give us what we need because God established the church. Now, I hope you've noticed something. Now, this is... A final principle I want you to see. The establishment of the church did not play, take place because man wanted it. The establishment of the church did not take place because man designed it. The establishment of the church did not take place because man did it. The establishment of the church relies upon God. And it is according to the Scriptures that we can learn about the establishment of the church. And aren't you glad this morning you can know that the church has been established? I'm so glad this morning you've taken some time to be with us on Walking with the Word, to study with us a portion of God's Word, to be able to understand that you can open up God's Word, you can see it, understand it, and know it. You can read it, you can hear it, you can be a part of it. And that you can walk with the Word daily in your eyes. You can be accountable to God's Word. This morning we've been studying about the establishment of the church. And let's walk with this knowledge. Let's go to heaven. Let's be God's people. Never forget the most important thing is going to heaven. Don't let anyone get in your way. Study God's Word. Learn God's Word. Walk with it every day in your lives. And let's go to heaven together. Thank you for joining us today for our study. If you have questions or comments, feel free to contact us at Post Office Box 329, Pulaski, Tennessee, 38478, or call 363-2777. We hope you will be with us again next Sunday at this same time. And we would be honored to have you in Bible classes at the East Hill Church beginning this morning at 9.30. Worship will follow at 10.30. We hope to see you then.